So Rory would have first plugged into his Strat into a Vox AC30 when he was in the show band, at the Fontana show band. So that would have been the uh, mid, about 65. Um, and then he would, in taste, which kind of, he'd started taste at the end of 66, going into 67. Um, the Range Master, I'm not exactly sure when he, he got hold of one, but uh, from sort of the first, uh, the second iteration of taste from 68 onwards, that's when you really hear it in those recordings. Um, and the best example of hearing the Vox, the Strat, and the Range Master together is the Isle of Wight concert. Um, that, you know, watch it on YouTube or the DVD, whichever, it's just um, ferocious. Just at that, sat on two fold out chairs, uh, screaming at a couple of hundred thousand people. It's pretty impressive. Uh, it's a hell of a sound. And he carried that through then, uh, f through his first two solo records. To me, this is really exciting. It's, made, it's, it's, it's so simple, but also you've got tons of control and you've got tons of scope to be you. That's why I've always shied away from pedals a bit because I've, I sometimes, as much as I like it when other people use them, I feel like they get in the way of me doing stuff myself. But maybe that's just my own hang-ups. But with this, it's really exciting because the control comes from you, volume control and you know tone controls and, and how you're attacking it yourself. But I don't know, it's just really pleasing to the ear and that makes you want to use it. Yeah. And as strats go, I mean, that, I, know, I know it's Rory's and, and we've heard it sounding amazing so many times, but to hear it actually being played, you know, right in front of us, it's, it's, it's a, such a great sounding strat, isn't it? It's unbelievable with this, with this amplifier and everything. I mean, it's the volume control right down, the clean sound. Really pretty, you know. Sorry, wrong chord then. It's just really pretty. You just keep opening it up. It starts getting a bit more live. What's really fascinating hearing you play that is, is it's a bit of a lost art these days when you've got so many ways to control your level through pedals or, or volume pedals or whatever. Hearing the kind of rich variety of sounds you can get just by using the, the controls on the guitar with an amp that's, that's kind of dimed. Yeah. And, and you hear all of the sort of harmonics sort of spring out of it the more you open the taps up, if you know what I mean. You don't lose that much volume either when you're backing the volume down, I don't think, you know, because if your band calms down a bit or something, I think everyone just played instinctively then and dynamically rather than thinking, oh, I need to be quieter, I've got to do that. You know, it's coming more from the, the player. And 
I don't know, that seems really exciting to me. Then it's more personal as well. Yeah. Would you would you mind just running quickly just through some of the pickup sounds, just, just sure. flipping flipping through? Okay, so we're on the bridge here. Clean sound. And then I suppose it's these two, is it? Next half. And then it's pretty fiery that front pick up in it. It's got quite a it's pretty So yeah, there's tons of sounds there anyway, isn't there? And then if you're using this and like Rory was, I don't know how he's reaching that sometimes. That tone control. I can't reach that. Then you can darken the sounds with that tone control as well, so. That's pretty fat there, isn't it, on that? So it's cool, because you can go from that. Loads of sounds in it, it's unbelievable. Really. And about 1973, he added the Fender Twin, which is hiding there. He definitely said that the, uh, in the quotes I've seen that he like the Vox is his favourite amp. Um, I think what would happen would, uh, hence sort of starting out with it, and then in this last rig that we have, go, bringing it back in. You know, so it, it, it was always there in the back of his mind, even when he was cheating on it with fenders, <laughs> whichever. Um, I think what happened then in, 70, in 73 is that uh, the addition of a keyboard player in the band, he had to sort of find his, his, uh, where he wanted his guitar tone to fit. Um, and I think that's, he added the twin in to sort of, um, I guess, I think like in taste and then that solo three piece, He's covering all the bases. Yes, there's a bass player in there, but you know all of the sort of texture comes from his guitar. And then with the addition of keyboards, he can kind of uh, mellow out a touch of his tone. And I think that's what the the Fenders did. And then as his, the venues got bigger and the American tours were with these huge acts like Deep Purple and the Faces and playing stadiums, he needed another one adding the uh, the, the four by ten basement in, um, kind of. Yeah, increasing, increasing the loudness that he could get. Yeah, so this is with uh, bringing the bass man in, as, as Rory would have done um, almost as the next step. We, we, we did try the twin, and uh, the twin wasn't loving it, but this, this is a setup that Rory would have used roughly in the same period, time period. So what's your impression of the difference between um, just the Vox on its own and then bringing in that sort of Fender power as well? well? When you bring another amp in, you've got a different voice, but you've also got, I guess, because you, you've got two sound sources, it just gets wider, even if they're two amps are close together. I mean, I don't know what his choice for doing that was. Was he starting to play bigger venues by then or something? Has that got anything to do with it? Or maybe it's just something that he liked. Because sonically they're so different, aren't they, a Vox and a Fender, that they complement each other when you put them together. And you get that more kind of solid low end out of that. I mean, there's a warm low end out of the Vox, but it's kind of, I always think it's got a slight fluffiness to it, whereas the Fender, you've got a bit more chug in that, I think. Amazing. Sitting in front of you, you can hear like pure definition and glass coming out of that, plus a bit of drive, and then you've got all of that lovely, savage kind of breakup off that. So you can see why you might want to put them together, because what you get is the, the sharp edges from that for definition, and then the, the lovely drive out of the box, you know. Yeah, because that's quite hi-fi, isn't it? And not that yeah. this is lo-fi, but you get all that, all the sort of singing harmonic stuff yeah. that's interesting to me is coming off. I mean, that's helping, that's creating that but it feels like those kind of harmonic overtones are coming off this so compared to some band setups it's not 
the big numbers in terms of power, but it definitely gives you more. Yeah. But it's still super musical. It's, it's such a vibe. I mean, yeah. you know, like I can't play that Rory stuff, but it's like it, it's a vibe. It's instantly creative and instantly musical. The response you're getting from this and that together. One thing I'm, I'm I'm really struck by when you're playing it is how touch sensitive either just the vox on its own or the two of them together are. You really hear everything and every shift of the control knobs you also has an effect, a musical and creative effect. It's really instant as well because I mean I'm not used to playing a, a Stratocaster but with that volume knob being there you can really control yourself quite easy, control your sound quite easily. There's just loads of scope isn't there really and loads of stuff to explore especially I mean playing on your own is one thing but if you've got your band with you there's just so much you can do just with this and yeah. the way you're interacting with each other. Yeah. And it's I think, mega exciting, I think. Oh, completely. And when you open, you wind up the volume, open the volume up full on this Strat, it's, there's so much um, power there on tap, isn't there? It's a natural boosting, really, because even with it up, not, you know, that's when it's on full, but when, even when it's back... Oh, sorry, the Vox is... Where's the Vox? Oh. Just wait for the Vox to come back on again, but... But there's enough sort of juice there to... to take care of stuff while you're singing and then if you want it to cut through when you're playing a, a lead break or whatever you're doing it's going to be there's loads of scope of the but you're not losing too much level loads of control there, it's cool. You know? It's super exciting, it's more exciting than presets. And for me anyway, it's just, and it just sounds better, doesn't it? So Rory was with the, the Vox and the Twin, and then the Vox left and the uh, basement came in. And I think that they were a good partnership for that. Um, he got really quite funky in, in about between 74 and 75, like the Against the Grain Irish tour period. The, uh, the band was brilliant and they were so tight, but they got quite funky and I think it suited the tone that was happening. And then by Calling Card Record, uh, which was produced by Roger Glover of Deep Purple, it kind of, it was like the first bits of like, a bit of that harder rock coming into Rory Sound on tracks like Moonchild. And I think that's why then dropping the twin and adding the concert in with the basement, Again, just getting bigger in volume, going, being able to push that bit more. I think that's where uh, the concert came in. I think that uh, just around that 77 period, which is that Check Shirt Wizard live album. That's those two together um, with these Hawk, uh, I've put them away over there, uh, the little Hawk. They're kind of like, uh, they're another treble booster, but really it's, an e it's another equalizer. And I think he would always push the mids on that through the basement. Um, and it, yeah, it was an incredible sound, like that basement is just phenomenal. Wow, it was quite different that one to the other one. What's your, what's your first impressions of playing the Esquire through the uh, the basement and the Hawk um, treble booster? It's a different voice, maybe it's a bit more aggressive, maybe. That's got a kind of softness to it, even though it's pretty leery. Yeah. I think that's, um, I don't know, it's sort of, sort of faster or something. I, I know that might sound daft, but it spits it out a bit more at you, that setup, I think. Yeah. And um, this guitar, I mean, obviously we've gone from the Strat, which is um, the guitar that, that uh, Roy's most associated with, but this is probably second in terms of, you know, guitars that people associate with Rory because um, of the slide work that he did on this Esquire. It's actually an Esquire, isn't it, that's been yeah. modded very heavily. So what's, what were your thoughts on playing this guitar? Well, it's definitely, it's, picking it up, it seems like it's more set up for bottleneck playing because the action's higher. Yeah. And... You know, maybe for whatever reason you prefer playing slide on this. I mean, you get a bit more sort of bright power out of a Tele Bridge pickup, don't you, than a yeah. Stratocaster one, sort of. It's a different voice, isn't it? It's a bit more stinging, really. Um, 
But yeah, it's an amazing guitar. I mean, it's super light and I don't know, it just feels really good. For someone like me who's not a telly player really, but it just feels instantly really great. Even with the slide set up, you know. I mean, we all know that the, the bass man was kind of the template for the Marshall sound when, when they kind of made their modifications to it. It became the, yeah. you know, JTM 45. Um, how do you think it compares to other Fender amps that, that we know and love? Because so, Fender made so many different amps and they've all got a voice and they're different eras. You know, you've got the tweed and then the brown and white era and then the, the black face era. I think there's loads of them that are really, really different. The bass one's got its own voice though, I think. It's, um, you can see it leans towards maybe what Marshall became. I suppose that was made with British or European components, or was it more? I don't know. But, um, but compared to other Fenders, I mean, the later bass ones that I used more often, like the white piggyback one, that's a totally different voice to that, being closed back cab and that stuff. But there's sort of an aggression and a sweetness to that at the same time, isn't there? And then moving into the stage struck era where it was the two Marshall 50 watts with this DB5, which is the only one I've ever <laughs> even seen. I did so on very old. And so he used that. It's got sort of three settings on it with sort of a distortion option and stuff, but he just used it as an equalizer. And again, it's got uh, it's a five band. And again, he'd be pushing the mids on the two Marshall 50 watts. Um, and yeah, so it, like you said, it's, it's sculpting a sonic position for him with the band. The Stay Struck era is definitely hard rock. There's touches of blues, but it's, it's definitely lent more to the rock period. It's 1980, and that would be the sort of the tone, again, ferociously loud. Um, and at the time, the drummer was Ted McKenna, who was probably Rory's hardest hitting drummer. And so maybe, yeah, in his thinking, it was, you know, that's my big tone for this period, this hard rock period. So going back to the, uh, his first solo records, and that would be the Live in Europe album, um, with Wilga Campbell on drums and Jerry McAvoy on bass. That was almost jazzy, when they, uh, even when they're kind of loud. They, they were a bit, not as freeform as taste, but they, they went off in places and Rory's runs are quite jazzy and it's quite a clean tone. Um, and then, like I said, with the, uh, around the Irish tour going into Against the Grain, the band then with Rod Diaz on drums, uh, uh, Jerry on bass again and Lou Martin on keyboards they kind of got quite funky. I think that you get, like he adds in covers of like, I take what I want, which is like a, a soul track and things like that. And uh, I think the Fenders fit, fit that. And then, yeah, like I said, Ted was a very, very big hitting drummer from the uh, sensational Alex Harvey band. And that, yeah, that period of time, that rock kind of, I guess like, you know, you've got Iron Maiden and ACDC kind of doing a lot of what Rory had already been doing. And you kind of, maybe he, I think sometimes like, yeah, Rory might have seen that he'd already done started something like Moonchild. I think you can, you definitely hear nods to that in Iron Maiden. If you listen to uh, uh, Two Minutes to Midnight, the riff is quite similar. And uh, so I think he might be then going, oh, well, they're doing that. So maybe kind of slightly kind of chasing his tail, having already kind of put that into the ether, then kind of getting louder with them. Um, and, uh, so, and then by the time 1990 comes along, uh, we've got uh, Geraint Watkins on, uh, piano and accordion. We've got Jerry still on bass, Mark Feltham on a harmonica, and Brendan O'Neill on drums. And this rig is just something, <laughs> something else. Um, everything's got something happening, the Vox with slap back on it, which he'd either use uh, a Dodd 608 or a Memory Man. Um, this pedal board, which, it, it, I mean, I, there's got the Octava in there, which I think is, is an immense thing that adds to the, some color to his solos. Um, at this point, so you've got like two solos in a song. Previously, he'd quite often play um, 
the first solo kind of straight finger picking one and then he will add in a slide solo so that there's like a, a lift in the track so it's like a different thing and then a kind of a similar idea like the first solo in a song might be just the the great tone that he's got and then he'll the second solo he'll add the octava on and you kind of get you know it's not that oh he's doing the same thing it's like a whole another level and then tube screamer to just go even louder when he wanted and then certain songs he'd have a, a very small touch of flanger on it uh bad penny shadow play would have those little touches of it just for variety and mystique and then he had the dynacomp which was on at this period all the time for just a small bit of compression on his playing um yeah, he still had the DB5 going into the Marshall, so that was definitely... It's funny how uh, certain pedals, or sorry, certain, well, they are pedals, but the boxes belong to certain amps. Like the Rangemaster belonged to the Vox. He never, you don't see him putting it into any of the Fenders. And same with that DB5, it goes with that Marshall 50 watt. And then this beautiful thing, I mean, uh, which it kind of came in towards the end, and I think it's, again, it's broadening out his sound, experimenting, and uh, yeah, filling, filling the room. Two of these marshals from this period, it's definitely more of a rocking sound than the others. The, the others are a bit more, I don't know, maybe it's just my generation, but they're a bit more kind of rootsy, the other sounds with tweeds and AC30s. But I do think there's a balance coming from the AC30 with these two marshals, which takes it out of just being that straight marshal thing. But you've got that treble that marshals have coming through here, and that sort of... Um, Marshalls have kind of got a sort of caustic thing about I don't know how else to describe it, but they have that thing that sort of spits at you a bit. And the Vox is adding that cool kind of papery sort of rip sound. That's the only way I can describe it, really. But I guess because there's a lot more things in the chain, and we, maybe we don't know exactly how Rory set it, there's a lot of different combinations of what it could be to get the tone that he had on, that, yeah. on the live recordings from that time. Whereas it's easier to maybe get closer when it was just the Range Master and the Vox. This is less stuff. I mean, well. one factor which changed, I think it's fair to say, Rory's needs from his amps was the rest of the lineup. So as you got a more filled out sound that might have included at some times in the later career, brass um, certainly included keys and um, that sort of thing. As a, as a professional player, what's your appreciation of the value of being able to cut through and find a notch within the frequency spectrum? In those you, def things? you definitely need, it's like mixing records, isn't it? You know, you're trying to find a way to get everything to f have its place. And sometimes you have to do stuff to sounds that on their own you wouldn't have to do. It's like, you know, mixing records, you're trying to get guitars to cut through, you might be taking a lot of low end out of guitars or something. And, and maybe this setup was suiting whatever his band line it was at the time. But also people's taste change. Maybe he didn't want to have the same setup all the time. He might have wanted to. You know, he might have been inspired by hearing other sounds or trying other stuff, which is quite natural for any musician, really. I guess his tastes were evolving as equipment was evolving and just trying new things out. Typical me being an old, old-fashioned git. I'd, I'd choose the Vox and the 
range master partly because that's a new thing for me because i'm mainly using fender amps and stuff and i love these tweeds they're they're absolutely brilliant but for me that's exciting and new hearing that voice and you know i'm, I'm not a stratocaster player and stuff so that was a that was a real thing you know i just thought wow you could, if you had the right songs the right band you you could just do the whole gig with that and i don't know if i can mention this or not but i did a, a thing a few years ago with Anthony Macaru testing out original Mark One Tone Bender with some of his boutique remakes, which were brilliant. And it was just so exciting then, a slightly different setup, but we had a Fender Esquire and an old Les Paul Standard, a 59, just into a little Selma amp. But that was a similar thing where the, the basic setup was so exciting, it was so alive, that the limitation wasn't a problem. It almost felt like there was less limitation because the sound was so exciting that you could delve into it. It was inspiring from the off, you know.